Right, carrying on with the 2019 Oxford Pat, we were up to question 18. This just looks like a standard bit of algebra here. We just have to solve this for x. So let's get everything on the flat, multiply through. So that'd be 2 divided by e to the x plus 10. Get rid of 9 on each side. Now multiply by e to the x, I suppose. So yeah, we've now got a quadratic in e to the x. I'm just doing an extra bit of rearranging on that line to get it into the standard format. That's going to factorise, isn't it? So we've got e to the x minus 2 e to the x plus 1. Well, e to the x can't be minus 1. because It's always got to be positive. So we're going to have e to the x is equal to 2. So x is equal to natural log of 2. Well, we don't mind those as questions. Moving on to question 19. Firework rocket launch vertically. The moment of explosion is moving with a vertical speed V0, 2 metres per second upwards. So upwards, 2 metres per second. Explosion releases an energy of one joule. So we've got one joule appears. And a rocket bursts into four pieces of masses, one, two, three, and four grams. Right, so the first bit then, so that was 10 grams. So we've now got a one, a two, a three, and a four grams. Piece of M4 moves up at one meter per second. M3 and M2 move horizontally. And M1 moves vertically. All velocities and directions are given relative to the ground. OK, obtain the speeds of all the pieces after the explosion. OK, so our options here are we've got conservation of momentum, which we can do in two directions, and we can do conservation of energy as well. So let's do the vertical conservation of momentum first then. So we've got 2 times 10. I'll just keep everything with grams has got to be equal to, so this is V1, let you just write them up here with the arrows, V1, V2, V3. So what was I doing? Oh yeah, momentum. So we'll have a V1 plus a 4 times 1. So V1 is equal to 16 metres per second. That's a good start. And then we can go horizontally and say that zero is going to be equal to 2v2 plus 3v3. All right, that's good, good. Now we can do conservation of energy. Oh, so that joule is going to be a bit of, Actually, the joule won't be that bad. We just got to multiply by a thousand if we're working in grams because energy and mass are proportional. So grams to kilograms joules up by a thousand so that's fine so we, we've got half mv squared so that's five times four plus the thousand so 1020 has got to be equal to a half of 16 squared so that would be 128 then we've got well we can do the the four ones easy because that's going to be two times one so that's two. Then we've got half of V2, so one, so V2 squared plus three over two V3 squared. Right, so off of this one, then we can say that V2 squared is going to be equal to nine over four V3 squared. Right, so what am I doing? So I'm just replacing that in there. So that's going to be 100 and, actually 130 plus 9 over 4 v3 squared plus 3 over 2 v3 squared right let's take this 130 off of both sides then so that's going to be 110 off of that so 890 then we're going to want to multiply everything by 4 i think it's probably going to be best isn't it because that will end up leaving us with 15 v3 squared on that side so four lots of that is going to be 3560 so 3560 over 15 is the v3 squared if i can say it 
That's uh, so what's that coming out as? I'll just put it in the calculator. V3 then comes out at say 15.4 meters per second, which means that V2 comes out at 23.1 meters per second. What is that? Is that everything they wanted? Obtain the speeds of all the pieces after the explosion. Right. Yeah, fair enough. The, yeah, they just said speed, so they've got nothing about velocity, so that's fine. The, so obviously, these are in one direction or the other. They've got to be in opposing directions, but that's okay. Well, what do I want next? Higher speed pieces can be obtained if the directions of movement of the pieces are different from those in part A. Under which choice of directions would the maximum speed of one of the pieces be achieved? So we want to get, but we have to have, we have to have vertical motion, must have vertical motion after explosion because of conservation of the momentum. After explosion due to momentum. So that's conservation of momentum. So we're going to be best off. So therefore keep motion in that direction that way and it would also make sense so yeah and have the fastest piece going upwards piece going upwards because we want we can have a net upwards uh, momentum net upward momentum so that's certainly one thing so where do we get our biggest bang for our buck then on the if we've got low mass then you get then higher velocity for a given momentum so we want to get the therefore we want to have the one gram mass traveling fastest going fastest and we want to put as much energy as that into that as possible so we're going to want to have yeah we want to get as much motion as that as we can so we can't have anything else going upwards we need to balance the because if anything else is moving upwards we have to put more momentum going downwards in order to balance it so we want to have the others going backwards yeah therefore all other particles go downwards so we only have to balance so only need to balance the upwards momentum need to balance upwards momentum at a one gram mass balance upward momentum of one gram piece because yeah if we had two bits going upwards then it means OK, not only do we have to balance the one gram one, you need the ones going downwards to be going faster in order to balance that. So they're taking energy away. Whereas if you've got three things going sluggishly downwards, then they can all just contribute to counteracting the upwards of the the upwards motion of the one gram mass. So we need to have M1 going upwards and M2. 2 m3 m4 going downwards yeah yeah that's quite an interesting way of thinking about it really yeah it's quite a nice question i don't mind things like that oh wow i've got again something new this is definitely the thing that they do in these more recent papers something that immediately looks scary as soon as you see it. i mean interferometers are talking about here so we've got two paths Path A, path B, top or bottom, a wave can take each one of those from the source of the detector. And we've got a difference in path length. Right. And it varies by some cos function here. So the intensity is measured. Length of the paths differ by amount L. Intensity of the detector I is measured and varies as that function. Yes. Fair enough. In the above k is the wave number of the wave which relates to the wavelength lambda via that all right so we've also got this equation just making it a bit clearer so that's just writing out that again 
I, P and IQ are constants. Right, sketch the intensity as a function of L in the range zero to two lots of lambda. Label both axes, identify, identify I, P and IQ in the sketch. Okie dokie, right, so if we're going from zero to two lambda, so what if we add that in there, that's for L. So we're going from zero, K, so that's cos zero, to cos of two lambda K. 2 lambda k is going to be 4 pi, cos of 4 pi. So we've got two cycles that we're doing on this. Right, let's scroll down and sketch. We, oh, we don't need negative axes because it's intensity, so that's going to be fine. This is L, that is I. It's going to be, so we're just doing a transformation of a cos graph here. We're going up to two lambda on this, which is, so we need two complete cycles. So we're gonna be doing down, up, down, up. Okay, just about squeezed it in. That's gonna be, so our midpoint is now IP, that's in the middle. And we're gonna be going plus or minus IQ. So that's gonna be IP, plus IQ, and then down here is gonna be IP minus IQ, because yeah, we're just doing a basic transformations. So we've rescaled the X axis. So this is going up to, yeah, up to two lambda there. So we've rescaled the X axis there, we've stretched there and we've translated upwards there. And yeah, that's everything really, that seems like that. Right, we wish to use the interferometer to measure how the path length difference L changes with time by measuring the intensity at the detector as a function of time. Right, so this is the opposite of this. The change in path length difference is delta L. Indicate on your sketch the biggest delta L you can infer unambiguously from a measurement of intensity. Right, so we need to... We need the inverse function then. So we want to get, so to get delta L from I, we need the inverse. We need the inverse of I as a function of L. And that means we need a one-to-one -one mapping because you, know, you can only have an inverse function if you've got a one-to-one -one mapping, which we don't here. Yeah, we can see that, okay, we might pick some value and come up to here and that gives us an I, but we want to go back again. So if we've got that I, well, we don't know if it's here or here or here or here. So we need to restrict the domain of L in order to then have an inverse. So we're going to have to do that between the minimum and the maximum. Yeah, you know, whichever bit we take, I mean, it could be between there, it could be between there and there. Yeah, you know, whatever happens, these are our delta L's. That's the biggest you can get. So that's the biggest delta L, which is a lambda over two. So a delta L max is going to be half of one of our wavelengths. So yeah, that doesn't come up very often. I, d I don't recall seeing in a PAP paper so far anything on restricting domain in order to get an inverse function. So yeah, that's an interesting addition. So yeah, and on that note, I'm gonna leave this video here. I think that's another little batch. Come back in the next video with the remainder of the paper.